So, okay, in the very beginning, uh, good morning and uh, good evening. Uh, I am Dr. P.Y. Cho, and uh, my colleague, Dr. Junior Tu, will moderate the webinar today. Welcome to ICC webinar. Professor Richard Harper is the Marley's the Larson Ed Endored Professor in Pediatric Craniofacial Surgery at the University of Washington. He is Chief of the Division of Craniofacial and Practice Surgery at Seattle Children's Hospital and the Surgical Director of the Craniofacial Center. His clinic practice focuses on the surgical treatment of cranial synostosis, clep lip and palate, rare and severe burst deformities of the bones and the soft tissue of the face, with a sub-focused on subcranial distraction procedures for complex upper airway obstruction. His research interests include image-based outcome studies for cranial synostosis and the complex craniofacial procedures, as well as device de design for clep and the craniofacial care. He serves on the Smile Train Global Medical Adversary Board and is co sponsor of the Partner in African Clep Team Training Program that has worked with African Clep teams in Ghana, Nigeria, and Ethiopia. As the current president of the ISCFS, Dr. Harper will be hosting the 20th Congress of the International Society of Craniofacial Surgery in Seattle, USA, September 5th to 8th, 2023. Today, we are so honored to have Professor Harper with us to present the topic, My Way to Treat Treatal Callings. Also, six experienced craniofacial surgeons are invited to the panel. I will introduce by the alphabet. The first one is Dr. Jong Woo Choi from Asan Hospital, Korea. The second is the Dr. Nopu Tangopadea from Doris Children's Hospital, USA. And then is Dr. Takayuki Honda from Iowa, Japan. And then is the Professor Clevin Lin from Chang'e Memorial Hospital. And uh, Professor Tin Chen Lu from Chang'e Memorial Hospital. Taiwan. And uh, then is the Professor Derek Stanbecker from Yale, USA. The webinar will begin with Professor Harper's presentation and the followed by panel discussion. And then is the QA session. Finally, we'll end up with the group photo. So I can wait to listen and learn from Professor Harper. So Professor Harper, please, thank you. Great, thank you very much, Dr. Cho, for pulling us uh, together uh, early in the morning in Seattle and late in the evening in Taiwan and, and, and Asia, but uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'd also like to uh, recognize and thank uh, Professor uh, Chen and Professor Lowe's um, support of this webinar series and also welcome my, my panelists and friends from around the country. Um, I was asked to talk on my, my way to uh, treat uh, Treacher Collins um, syndrome, which we're all aware is a challenge at all of our craniofacial centers. I apologize, I'm having a... There we go. So Treacher Collins um, syndrome um, is, uh, is rare, one in 50,000, but at major craniofacial centers such as ours and, um, and Chang'an and, uh, and other centers across the world, uh, we do see these patients referred to us. Uh, they have a high incidence of uh, obstructive sleep apnea, um, and it's been reported up to 40% of the patients referred can have a tracheostomy. So this is a very complex um, group, and they have a, a very unique and complex um, airway. The burden of um, pediatric tracheostomy can't be under, underestimated. It's, uh, it's been reported um, that there's up to a 1% mortality per year. Um, from either airway obstruction, mucus plug, or, or bleeding. It's incredibly expensive in the United States. Um, it can uh, go up to $100,000 of lost wages, medical supplies, and, and medical needs. So there's an incredible stress on a family. 
So anything we can do to be able to get a tracheostomy out of uh, uh, children with Treacher Collins um, is, is worth the effort. These kids, as you probably are aware, are above um, average intelligence. Um, uh, very often they, they go to college, um, are very um, productive when they're given the opportunity. And so if you're looking at this very severe phenotype of Treacher Collins that is tracheostomy dependent, it is really restricting um, the potential of these of these amazing, amazing individuals. So for the rest of this um, talk, I, I will not be uh, talking on the mild variants of Treacher Collins um, that just may need some eyelid surgery or some, some cheek surgery or fat grafts. What I'd like to focus on is the very severe phenotype um, that has the, the tracheostomy. So I think uh, uh, Dr. Steinbacher will recognize these images from his, um, his excellent paper that uh, described the airway um, specific to Treacher Collins. It's, it's not a single level um, disease um, as, his, uh, as his paper back in 2015 showed very nicely. Uh, the, the airway of the Treacher Collins is very much like a tight pipe right from the nose all the way down to the vocal cords. And uh, because of this, um, you start to wonder it's, if it's a multi-level airway disease, why would we be treating uh, this airway compression purely with a single level surgery such as mandible um, distraction? And this is one of my own cases, and um, I'm old enough now that I, I don't mind showing my bad results as opposed to only my, my great results. So this is a patient that had isolated mandible distraction early in my practice back in 2006. Um, and again, the slides that are often shown are the ones that are on this the second to left slide there where you have a good ch a change in the uh, chin point. All of us must follow these kids uh, long-term to be able to see what the long-term outcomes are. And as you can see on the far right, um, within two years, it's almost as if we never did the surgery. And it's not that it didn't heal, the, the bone ossified just fine. It's just the incredible soft tissue um, environment of the Treacher Collins um, mandible and face um, has a, a quite a, a morphing change on, on mandibles after distraction. And so when you look at the, um, the, the bone changes that occur, um, those were the soft tissue changes, you can see that the length of the mandible is preserved, but it's the position of the mandible relative to the skull base that doesn't change with mandible distraction. Um, we're essentially just lengthening one bone, but really, is this going to be able to correct the airway that Dr. Steinbacher's uh, paper um, showed extends from the nose down to the vocal cords? Obviously, I think the answer we realize is, is no, and that's been shown well in the literature with a a relatively low success rate of being able to remove tracheostomies with isolated uh, mandible distraction. When you look at a, a lateral cephalogram of a patient with uh, treacher Collins syndrome, they may look uh, normal occlusive and you start to think, well, both jaws um, seem to be in the okay position relative to each other. Um, but when you, um, uh, when you look at the, uh, uh, the, the, the lateral cephalogram uh, with a superimposed, superimposed Bolton standard. So this is now a standard lateral cephalogram. You can see that the, the entire subcranial skeleton of the Treacher Collins um, face is rotated backwards. It's essentially not a linear deformity, it's a rotational deformity. Um, and this again is, um, is uh, unique and, and therefore not uh, really should not be treated with single level um, surgery. This is not a, an original concept. Um, uh, Paul Tessier, the, the grandfather of craniofacial uh, surgery, back in 1986 did um, publish a paper on something he called the procedure integrale, which is the um, attempt to be able to rotate the subcranial skeleton using the techniques that were available at the time, which include wires and bone grafts. And again, with all the craftsmanship that, uh, that uh, uh, Dr. Tessier um, had available to him um, in all his skill, he, he was only able to achieve somewhere around seven degrees of rotation, which is comparable to what we achieve now with the Lafort one osteotomy. Um, and uh, unfortunately, he abandoned this technique because he said, number one, it was too complicated and uh, took uh, uh, too much risk on the patient. And uh, the, the other one is he found that the relapse was, was quite high. Again, the, the problem with the soft tissue um, envelope pulling things back. So when we look at the Treacher Collins dysmorphology, I think it's really a, a difference in the vertical height of the anterior face relative to the posterior face. And uh, although this can be somewhat corrected with traditional bimaxillary surgery, 
that's usually, as you know, reserved um, for patients uh, in permanent dentition. And so doing those kind of surgeries in young kids to remove the tracheostomy would not be feasible. And also, I think in, in all of our hands, no matter how experienced we are, the rotation achieved by a Lafort 1 bilateral sagittal split osteotomy is at most 7 to 10 degrees on, on average. So when we look at the, uh, the, the airway compression that is um, caused by this differential um, vertical dysmorphology, what we need to be able to open up that entire airway um, uh, that Dr. Steinbacher's paper showed from the nose down to the vocal cord is really a resetting of the subcranial skeleton. We need to rotate the entire skeleton, including the maxilla and the mandible uh, relative to the skull base. So the question is, 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 is how do we do that? I'd like to um, uh, recognize one of my partners, Dr. Cesarla, for coming up with this um, uh, acronym, Counterclockwise Craniofacial Distraction Osteogenesis. He's a, he's a Star Wars um, uh, fanatic, and so I, I think it uh, alludes to the, uh, the, the gold robot we all know as C-3PO, but this is C-3DO um, uh, for the uh, subcranial rotation surgery. Um, uh, this is the... Um, the technique in brief, um, how, it's, how it's achieved. So many of the cases that are referred to me now um, have severe mandible deformity as well as the subcranial rotation. They typically are Przansky, Kaban, type three mandibles without a condyle. And uh, I've tried different ways and I find it's best to reconstruct the, uh, the joint first and then do the rotation um, second. So the, the first um, pr procedure is a nucleation of the uh, second molar follicle. That follicle is typically in the way, is not going to erupt in a very severe Przansky 3 mandible. And that creates sufficient bone to do the future mandible distraction part of the C3DO procedure. So this is the first stage that patients will fly into Seattle, have their rib graft, and usually fly back home after uh, two days um, in Seattle just to make sure that the, the graft is healing okay. This is a standard uh, costochondral technique that is not uh, um, uh, unique to um, this um, procedure. Um, but uh, what I do um, uh, like to use is virtual surgical planning um, for the rib graft. Uh, I, in my own hands, uh, would maybe be about 80% accurate, I think, with, um, with placing these grafts accurately um, without the, the, the um, help of either stereotactic navigation or virtual planning. I find it very easy to have the graft um, too anterior and not articulating with the, um, the skull base um, the way that we want to. This planning gives us a nice uh, a view of the bone thickness. It allows us to place the um, screws away from the nerve and away from the, uh, the, the tooth follicles. And I just find it's much uh, faster surgery than um, without virtual planning. After the uh, rib grafts are in place, uh, nine to 12 months later, the patients will return to Seattle for the big rotation surgery. Um, the surgical techniques are, are not uh, any, any different than um, what we do routinely um, in our, in our um, practices. It's a standard uh, Lafort 3 or Lafort 2, depending if they have zygomas osteotomy. Um, so a subcranial separation through the coronal incision. And at the same time, we'll do um, mandible osteotomies, um, typically inverted L's behind the uh, lingula, behind the uh, inferior alveolar nerve. And again, these are very severe mandibles. This is, this is not um, uh, what I would, I would, the patients that have, for example, Przansky type one or type 2A or even type 2B are, are usually not um, candidates for this surgery. These are the very severe Przansky 3s or severe 2B um, dysmorphologies. Once I do those osteotomies, the entire facial skeleton has to be locked together into one piece of bone. And again, it's, it also shows um, uh, that the reason why these patients um, are severe enough to need a tracheostomy. Their tracheostomy and their gastrostomy tube will help them during this period because their jaws will be uh, wired shut um, during the rotation surgery. I take a little piece of bone um, out of the radix, which is the rotation point. And so that's going to be the point that the entire facial skeleton is going to rotate on. The next thing I'll do once I've done these osteotomies is to um, place the um, mandible um, uh, distraction devices. Again, they tend to be severe mandibles um, and uh, the, the very little um, bone available. So uh, I have done um, some internal devices, but you, most of the cases referred to me, their mandibles are too small for the internal devices. So I'll use the external devices. For these very severe mandibles, I will actually do transfacial pins. Um, and there's two reasons for that. One reason is 
if it was um, just into the mandible itself and not transfacial, the pins would likely become unstable. Um, as you know, the pins can uh, become loose in the bone very easily. And so this way um, it, um, it has a secure um, uh, uh, attachment to the bone. The second reason, which is equally important, is that the, uh, the bone um, uh, needs to be stabilized because there's a lot of backward force um, on the mandible. And if that is transmitted to the condyle, um, specifically if it's transmitted to those rib grafts, um, they will absorb and you'll have secondary condylar changes. It won't happen immediately. It'll happen two, three, four years later, but it's important to protect, the, protect those condyles from backwards pressure. So that's where in the severe cases, I will use um, these transfacial pins. Once the transfacial pins are in place, uh, the, the patient is um, in maxillary mandibular fixation um, with the traction splint. Um, you can see by the radix, I'm just um, tying two wires there, um, which will create the new hinge. So now if you imagine the entire facial skeleton is hinged on the radix and it's locked together um, uh, with the splint and the mandible distraction device is ready to lengthen the mandible. If I only did this with the mandible device, um, it would create a lot of pressure and would not cause a rotation to take place. And, and because of that, I uh, need to use the external uh, um, halo device to be able to create an upward um, um, pull on the entire facial skeleton. So what you what I like to think of is that the mid face device, the halo device is pulling the face um, away from the subcranial skeleton. And that's the most important um, force. Whereas the mandible, um, I, I say there it's pushing, it's not really pushing. I, I more visualize it as making sure that the condyles are staying seated um, in the skull base. So the mandible device seats the condyles, the mid face device pulls the face forward. And what you're able to achieve with this sub subcranial rotation is an entire resetting of the facial skeleton. So it's a, it's a movement that is um, uh, not achievable in my hands with traditional techniques. It's really using the power of distraction osteogenesis that uh, Dr. Joseph McCarthy and others introduced to us in the mandible. And now we're learning how to translate it to other parts of the facial and the, the cranial skeleton. So this is, the, this is the movement that we want to achieve with the C3DO procedure. And so this is the, um, uh, the, the movement. You can see that it's a combination of advancement and rotation. This uh, video only shows the uh, external mandible um, device, but really that entire pull is taking place with the halo device. And the rotation point is at the radix. That the reason the radix doesn't uh, move is because there's a, a wire there. Uh, sometimes I use PDS suture, but most of the time I'll put a, a 28 or 26 gauge wire just to stop the face from dropping and to force it to rotate. And with this technique, we're able to achieve a powerful reset of the entire subcranial skeleton. So the, the mandible does advance, but the mandible advancement is not any greater than what we achieve with uh, typical mandible surgery. Its uh, power is really in the rotation. We've, we've, we're learning this um, uh, also in the Lafort 1 literature. If you uh, look at um, uh, some of our uh, the literature in our um, uh, oral maxillofacial um, uh, journals, uh, you'll see that uh, the, there's also a recognized improvement in airway with Lafort 1 um, impaction and BSSO rotation, BSSO rotation. But with this technique um, uh, in these young kids, we're able to achieve a much greater rotation that you can achieve with traditional um, procedures. Now in Tricia Collins, as you're aware, they have the Tessier 6, 7, and 8 um, facial cleft on the missing zygomas in many cases. And so what I'll typically do when I bring them back to the operating room three months later for the removal of the uh, distraction devices, I will do a full thickness um, zygoma reconstruction. Uh, Joseph Gruss, one of my old partners um, for the past 20 years, um, who's unfortunately no longer with us, uh, taught me that the, 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 the zygoma grafts really need to be full thickness um, to avoid resorption, and I agree with them, and that's what I've, I've done throughout my, throughout my practice. Um, I use uh, virtual planning also for these zygomas. I used to, early in my practice, make it um, with um, different osteotomies and do the, do the carpentry um, on, the, um, uh, on the table. But what I find now is doing the planning ahead of time really saves a lot of time. I identify the maximum curvature of the parietal bone. Um, that becomes the, the new malar prominence. Um, sometimes I need to reconstruct in severe cases the orbital um, floors. 
the zygomas are typically switched. So the left cranium becomes the right cranium and the right cranium, the left cranium, and then the um, uh, other bone grafts are used for the floor if needed. Uh, the nice thing is these are full thickness grafts, but I'll also take uh, other cranium uh, and split it to be able to do the cranioplasty. And so therefore there's no cranial defects left um, at the end of the procedure. So this would be the example of the cutting guides um, and the different things that we're all aware of. And again, this is nothing new. Um, many of us use this in our practice, but it is a, a nice way to be able to save time for these complex zygoma reconstructions. And this would be an example of a patient actually I just did uh, uh, two weeks ago um, uh, from the East Coast who, who uh, needed the floor reconstruction as well as the, um, uh, the zygoma reconstruction due to the severity of his uh, vertical dystopia. And you can see that the cranial reconstruction of, um, is with the remaining split calvarial graft using resorbable plates. And so that would heal so that there's no defects in the, the cranium. So that, that's the final stage of the C3DO, the zygoma um, reconstruction. So rib graft is typically the first, nine to 12 months later, the subcranial rotation, and then three months later, the zygoma reconstruction. And these are the, the results that um, uh, we've, we've published. These, these are public um, uh, pictures um, that um, are, are in patients um, that had the C3DO procedure. These are patients that have not had rhinoplasties, have not had fat grafting, have not had any eyelid surgery. They, they, they've only had the C3DO procedure. So you can see there is some beneficial change to the lower eyelids, um, um, the cheeks, um, the, the nose and, and, the, and the chin, but this is purely for an airway surgery. So this patient did have a previous mandible distraction um, the, that was successful, but not successful in removing the, the tracheostomy. Um, she had the C3DO and was able to have the tracheostomy removed. Um, here is a uh, patient with uh, came from uh, Texas, um, had a tracheostomy, had another previous mandible distraction in, in Texas, was unable to be decannulated, um, had the C3DO procedure in, in Seattle and, and was able to be uh, decannulated. Another patient here from New York had had uh, four previous mandible distractions, um, seven uh, coanal surgeries at another institution, tracheostomy was unable to be removed, um, had the C3DO procedure and we were able to remove the tracheostomy. This is another patient from, from Texas, same thing, had a, a previous coanal surgery, had not had previous mandible distraction, which is nice because that makes the surgery a lot easier. Um, but um, uh, after, the, uh, after the C3DO was able to be decannulated. And these are the, the airway changes that we're able to um, achieve with the C3DO procedure. So on the um, uh, left is in neutral position, middle jaw thrust, uh, right is the exposure that the anesthesiologist will see. Um, before on the um, uh, top and after C3DO on the bottom, you can see the anesthesiologist is now getting a grade one um, uh, view of the molecular cords. That's our goal. Now, not every patient gets a grade one, but we've always been able to get them to grade one or grade two, which will take away their category as being a airway at risk. If a patient has a grade three airway, um, they're unable to be intubated um, by other, anyone other than a very complex um, airway team. So it creates an airway that is um, much more safe to intubate, it, to intubate and allows them to, um, to be able to travel outside of big cities because if they ever needed to be intubated for an emergency, their, their um, airway would be able to be um, accessed in the standard fashion. And these are the polysomnography changes. The reason that there's um, only 10, we've done uh, 20 of these, is that um, about 10 of the cases were unable to be capped um, for a sleep study before the C3DO procedure. Um, and uh, so therefore you can't do a, a sleep study. So uh, a patient that fails capping of the trachea um, would not have a preoperative sleep study. They would have a postoperative one, but these are, these are consecutive um, uh, sleep studies before and after C3DO. So you can see the improvement in the um, apnea hypopnic index, um, the sleep efficiency and the desaturation index um, after the surgery. And we continue to re repeat these sleep studies um, based off of symptoms as we continue to follow these kids. Um, because um, again, this is not something where we want to remove the tracheostomies and have to put them back in a year or two later. We want to be able to maintain them um, decannulated and without their tracheostomies until they need their bimaxillary surgery as, um, as teenagers. So this is what we achieve with um, mandible distraction. It's, um, it's an expansion of the um, uh, oropharynx in, in green. Whereas what we achieve with C3DO is really an expansion of all three um, airway chambers. 
Um, and so that's really the power of the C3DO is the expansion of more than just the um, oropharynx, um, like, like Derek's um, paper showing that complex um, tube airway of Treacher Collins, uh, the rotation surgery is able to achieve all, all levels of expansion. So if you look at, um, these are some of my patients with, that had mandible distraction um, with Treacher Collins. You can see that I, I achieved a, a big increase, 100% increase in their oropharynx. Whereas with C3DO, um, I've um, uh, not achieved um, only the expansion of the oropharynx, but also um, of the, the nasopharynx. So because of that, um, the um, actual um, expansion is, is averaged um, along the entire airway. So it's like a pipe that has a, a, a narrow pipe that has a kink in it. It not only releases that little kink, that little compression, it widens the entire pipe. And because of that, the the total airway expansion is double what I was able to achieve um, with the mandible distraction alone. So C3DO was able to double the expansion compared to isolated mandible distraction. And when we look at the degree of airway expansion, it is proportional to the um, uh, rotation. Um, so for every degree of rotation, the total volume of the airway increases by 6% and um, uh, the oropharynx increases by 12%, which makes sense the further down the face the more things are going to be expanding because everything is rotating at the nose. So the biggest changes are at the level of the, the lower mandible. The least change um, is at the top of the nose with this rotation surgery. So now this is this is some unpublished data that um, we're getting together um, to be able to publish. It's um, just a review of, of seven years of the, the C3DO procedure. Um, we worked at, uh, done this on 20 syndromic cases, all of them tracheostomy dependent, all of them have G-tubes. Um, most of them had previous surgeries that were not successful in removing the tracheostomy. You can see the average age is nine years. I have done this surgery as uh, the youngest is three years old. I would not advise that. It's, it's it, typically the bone is not as stable. Um, uh, especially the Lafort 3 rotation. And uh, so my recommended age when patients come to me is to start to get the rib grafts at age five. And so they're ready for the C3DO procedure at age seven. Uh, 18 out of 20 were decannulated. So this is not a 100% um, success rate. It's a 90% it's a success rate so far in the series. Um, uh, one patient is having some soft, soft tissue surgery to try to um, get decannulation. Um, I think one patient, um, there's another patient from Texas that I don't think we'll ever be able to decannulate. I, I think just because of the severe phenotype, even though the, the bone rotation was successful, um, the, um, the, the, the muscle tone is not sufficient for decannulating the other patient. So um, right now it's at 90%. We'll see with time if this continues. This is the, the part that's very um, sobering. I want to, sobering and I want to recognize one of my old um, partners, um, uh, my old fellow, sorry, um, Howard, Howard Wang from um, a couple of uh, uh, years ago. Uh, who's now at Rainbow Babies um, in Cleveland. Uh, he, he started to look at this data and he'll be on the paper um, when we publish it. But what it looks at like is the change of, of uh, cephalometric measures over time. So there's some patients that I'm able to follow up to five to seven years and there's other ones that are, are still in, in follow-up. So what you can see is that um, only around 30% of uh, facial advancement is maintained, um, which again, doesn't sound like a lot this is still, however, um, uh, based on symptoms and repeat sleep studies sufficient to keep these patients decannulated, and, and we'll talk about why. The maxillar mandibular relationship, though, which is the relationship between the maxilla and the mandible, is preserved. So it's not that the mandible falls back behind the maxilla or the maxilla falls back behind the mandible. They both stay together. So there's a, a, a retrusion of the entire face um, uh, during the, the years after C3DO. Um, of the palate rotation, roughly around 9% of the um, palate rotation is preserved. So that's around half. We're able to achieve, up around, we typically Early on in our series, we achieved around 20 degrees of rotation. We're now trying for more degree, degrees of rotation, understanding this, this, um, these changes that happen after C3DO, but we're maintaining around 50% of our, of our rotation in long term. And the mandible length um, is not only preserved, but continues to um, grow, as does the facial uh, lower facial height. So in, in summary, what we're seeing um, is a preservation of facial length um, but a retrusion of the bimaxillary face and roughly around 50% of rotation lost. So, so how does this compare with traditional Treacher Collins orthognathic surgery? And I want to reference a paper of one of my mentors and, and friends and colleagues, uh, John Phillips, who I know 
uh, Professor Yurei Chen knows um, very well at Hospital of Sick Kids in, in Toronto. And he, he published a beautiful paper back in 2015 showing his one year results um, in Treacher Collins after Lafort won the SSO. And what uh, John was able to uh, show um, is that uh, it's a very similar, he has around a 25% relapse of SNA, so not as much as we get with the C3DO, but this is again with a much smaller degree of advancement than was achieved with the C3DO. All of the rotation change that was achieved with Lafort 1 BSSO is lost um, after one year. Um, and um, you can see that the mid face length is, is preserved, but mandible length is also preserved. So this is only after one year. Um, John didn't publish or uh, wasn't able to publish the results up to five years, but you can see the relapse that occurs following any um, orthognathic surgery in Treacher Collins, whether you're doing Lafort 1 BSSO or if you're doing the C3DO procedure. And I think the the emphasis is now on, as we know this data and learn this data, is on over over correction, because this is typically what we're seeing is happening is that the uh, left is before the C3DO um, at, at age 10. This is after um, C3DO after the zygomas go on, and you can see what happens um, six years later that the facial length continues to grow, um, mandible continues to grow. Um, but there's um, a slight swing back of the rotation um, that was achieved with the initial procedure. But again, so far, none of our patients have been needed to be recannulated. They all um, uh, continue to pass their sleep studies and um, uh, they, they will, however, all of them need bimaxillary surgery, such as what John published on um, at the age of maturity. So now my, my goal is overcorrection, knowing this degree of relapse. So I'm, I'm I'm over rotating the maxilla. I'm over lengthening the mandible, and um, and uh, using all the powers of distraction to be able to um, create um, more than what I want to achieve. So that um, when they do undergo that relapse, uh, the the final position is in, is um, is favorable. So in in summary, uh, subcranial rotational deformity can be corrected by C3DO. Distraction is a powerful technique, and we use um, all the techniques that we know together um, can achieve a subcranial reset of the pediatric facial skeleton. It has been successful in decannulating complex airway cases that were not able to be decannulated with single-level um, airway surgery, such as mandible um, distraction. Um, but there is around a 50% rotational and advancement relapse um, five years after the surgery. So we have to build that into the plan. Um, they all will require Lafort 1 BSSO, which will um, help it, um, take care of some of that, um, that loss. The vertical growth does continue. So this will not be locking in the, the vertical um, size of the pediatric face. They will grow into adult size. And so far, we have not had to repeat a tracheostomy. Uh, we have a multidisciplinary team that needs to approve decannulation. It's not my choice. It's the otolaryngology and pediatric services choice to remove the tracheostomy. So I feel more comfortable when it's removed that it's it's not me and my, my bias after doing the surgery. But again, it, it'll make it a challenging double jaw surgery at maturity. I, I look forward in another five to 10 years to be able to um, show that um, that data. So I'd like to, to thank you very much for your attention. I did want to leave time for the panelists to um, uh, ask some questions and facilitate a, a discussion. Um, this is um, this is Seattle in, in September. Um, and you can see the Space Needle on the left. And I'd like to be able to welcome you um, and invite you to Seattle uh, next fall for the International Society of Craniofacial Surgery uh, 20th Congress, which will take place September uh, 5th to September 8th. So please save it on your calendar. Um, the Congress website is live. You can see it right there, icfs-2023.com. Um, we'll also be updating our entire uh, icsf.org um, uh, uh, um, website um, in the next month. The, in 1962, we had the Seattle World's Fair in Seattle. That's when the Seattle Space Needle was built. And uh, the theme of our 20th Congress is similar to the 1962 World's Fair. It's shooting for the stars. Um, learning from our past and planning for the future of craniofacial surgery. Um, it'll start um, on Tuesday with a pre-Congress um, symposium um, uh, that's going to be focused on extended reality. So uh, augmented reality, virtual reality, extended reality, um, artificial intelligence, robotics. Um, it'll be having some very robust panel discussions, invited lecturers from the technology field, but also which will be fun, there'll be a technology fair. So you'll have a chance to be able to play with the technology, put on the goggles, try the robots, and and um, enjoy the, the advances of technology that we're starting to um, uh, see in um, craniofacial surgery. The abstract topics are on the website. 
Um, it'll be a very robust um, discussion. It's been four years now since our in-person um, meeting that we had in Paris. I think we're all eager to, to get together. It'll be held at the Hyatt Regency, a brand new hotel downtown Seattle. You'll be able to walk wherever you want to in Seattle. Big meeting halls, great place to meet. And uh, we've got a very reasonable uh, room rate, so please book your, your rooms. And uh, for the gala dinner, we'll be di uh, dining underneath the Blackbird um, supersonic jet um, at the Boeing Museum of Flight. So that'll be an exciting way to finish the uh, Congress. The uh, registration will be live uh, December the 1st, so please register early. Abstract submissions are now available to be submitted anytime now, but we'll um, need to, the abstract deadline is March 15th. Um, so please, um, uh, I look forward to the, the, the experience that, uh, that uh, is on this webinar from Chenggang and, and uh, Korea and Japan um, would be so welcome at this meeting and would really add to our understanding of craniofacial surgery. So I really look forward to all your, your um, uh, uh, presentations. And finally, um, any um, uh, societies um, in uh, Asia, um, either regional or national, that would like to advertise their, their events on the icfs.org website, please let me know at info at icfs.org. And we'll be able to adver advertise things like, for example, this um, excellent Chang'an webinar, we'd be able to advertise that for you on our, on our website. So thank you very much um, for your attention. And um, uh, I look forward to um, having now a robust discussion with our panelists. Thank you, Dr. Cho. Thank you so much, Professor Hopper, um, for the amazing lecture and presentation. Now, um, before we go on to the panelists, I just like to comment that um, for sure the Tongan team will be sending a lot of participants to the Congress and will be um, very excited to join you guys there for the uh, conference. So um, without further ado, I'd like to go to our uh, panelists. And in alphabetical order, I like to first invite Dr. J.W. Choi, Professor Choi. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, yes. I can, J.W. Yes, Thank you. yes. Thank you. So Richard, so you made a beautiful presentation tonight. Actually, uh, the I think you made a, uh, the management of the Trichocholine syndrome is a, a kind of state of art. So, Actually, we uh, already know the management of trigeal syndrome with the, one of the most our challenges. So, um, first of all, I'd like to congratulate uh, your successful the um, C three deal. So, its pronunciation looks good. <laughs> it looks it sounds so good. So, the um, uh, considering the uh, original Dr. Tessier's the uh, mandible the report to setback. So. Actually, overall, you all, the the vector would be quite the uh, different original the, um, the Dr. Dr. Tessius, the vectors. Actually, the Dr. Tessius mostly focused on the setback like this while the mm -hmm. controlling. So, but you focused on the advancement and then rotation. So, what about the audible? Um, adapt the adapt the uh, the Dr. Tessius the uh, the bacteria. I think yeah, the nose in Asian view, the nose is a little big in your the uh, sides. So if you do a little, a little more setback on the upper parts, you can get a little more rotation of bacteria. So, what do you think about that? I think that's a I think that's a great idea, JW. I never actually thought of it, and that's why um, discussions like this are so un important. I, I agree. I think I think um, again, trying to imagine what. Paul Tessier was thinking is hard to, to do, but my guess is with his tra traditional technique, um, he wanted to be able to impact to be able to maximize bone stability because he needed to get bone to bone contact with his plate, you know, his wires. Um, he didn't even have plates at that time. Um, but I, I agree with you that um, if we were to remove some of the um, bone from, like I, I showed my picture, I was remove a little wedge of bone, but your idea of maybe removing a little bit more bone so that there's more of an impaction. Um, you're right, because what it would do is it would um, it would uh, shorten the face slightly. Um, the only thing I would we would have to watch is it would it would change the um, the swing of the pendulum. So instead of it swinging this much, we would maybe swing it this much because we would be impacting. So that may not give as much change of the mandible um, as if we we had a shorter arm. So I think you would have less mandible advancement 
but at the same time, you're right, we would have more favorable nasal orbital change. Um, I, I've been a, a lot of these patients do not want a rhinoplasty, but I think um, a lot of them would benefit from a rhinoplasty to correct exactly what you mentioned. But I, that's a great idea. I think I'd like to look at that from a supplementary view and maybe um, plan a different approach. Yeah, so actually, in general, I completely agree with your approach because you the a, you looks like aiming at the real the correction of the real cause of the trees or Collins syndrome. So I absolutely will give you the um, you know, the new approach the C three DVEO yeah, will be a uh, main the uh, approach for the management of the trees or Collins syndrome in the near future. Thank you for sharing your ideas and your approach. Great, thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Choi. Uh, next, I'd like to invite Professor Newport. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Hopper. I always learn a lot when I hear your talks. Um, and I think similar to like the experience I had when I was a fellow and you were talking about the Lafort 2-3, um, this to me really has revolutionized how I think about Treacher Collins. Um, and so I'm now in the point in my practice where I'm in year eight. So now my treacher columns patients are actually old enough for me to start talking about this. So one of the um, questions I had for you is, you know, when you're starting out, of course, and you have these babies in the NICU and you're talking to the parents about the tracheostomy, what sort of nuances to the discussion are you able to give them that really convince them to be able to wait that long versus maybe going somewhere else to get early distraction, because I think that's the struggle I have is, you know, really counseling them that this is a long-term process, but we need to wait until the child is big enough that we're not going to be unnecessarily operating on them. Yeah, that, that's a that's a great point. It's a critical point, I think, that comes up, Newport, as you realize, is um, in competitive markets in, in the United States, especially, um, if you don't offer an early surgery, somebody will try to offer it and, and you know, grab the patient, and I completely understand that. Um, I think uh, the most helpful thing is is when they're tied into support groups, which a lot of treacher Collins are if they, you know, have access to webs and social media. And um, when they hear from other treacher Collins patients um, that medical distraction was a big deal when the child was young, did not remove the tracheostomy, it was quite painful, wasn't worth it, then I think they they buy in. Um, and if if they don't have that access, providing that access, you know, Lurie's Children has a great has a great network and and um, support. So I think that's probably the, the key. Um, I've always been asked, like, is it a really a, if you know, is it okay to do a mandible distraction before a C three DO? Um, my answer is is that everyone has to make their own decisions. I I choose not to, but doing an isolated mandible distraction does not stop being able to do a C three DO. It just makes it just that little bit more challenging. Yes, I think, yeah, I'm definitely in the point of trying to get them to wait as long as I can and trying to avoid going into a scarred field. So thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Newport. Uh, next, I'd like to invite Professor Honda. Hi, hello. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you very much for the lecture. I'm really surprised and the really um, excited with your technique. Uh, my question is about the uh, zygoma reduction. You you may uh, told that the the age at the uh, reconstruction start at the five years old, right? Right? Is it right? Um, is that is that a minimum age for the reconstruction? Because the if the too early reconstruction, you cannot get the uh, sufficient bone from the carbaria. Uh, do you have any? Uh, opinion for that. Yes, thank you. Thank you, P Professor Honda. I, I, um, I agree with you that the zygoma should not be done too early. And um, when I did do this for one of my, I think my second, my third case of C3DO was done on a three-year-old and it, it, um, it, it, I did not do the zygoma reconstruction because of that reason. And that's why I didn't get stability of the Lafort 3 So that's why I, I wait until age seven for the actual C3DO procedure. Um, age five is when I would um, typically plan the, the the rib graft reconstruction of the Przansky 3 mandible, um, and then um, plan to do the C3DO at the earliest age seven. So I will not do the actual rotation surgery until seven. And then they usually return a year after that for the zygoma, oh, sorry, actually 
three months of the activation, so three months for the rotation, um, and then they would return for the zygoma. So they're usually around seven and, a, seven and a half to eight years old when I do the zygomas, which at that time it is a, you are able to split the um, split the bone. But I agree with you that doing a, a zygoma restriction bef before that would not be a good idea. For full thickness grafts, age seven is a good good time. It also coincides with the time that the the facial skeleton stops growing, as you know, at, at age seven for this from the top top part. So it's okay to do it at that age. But thank you for that. That's a very good clarifying point. Thank you. Okay. And the one more question, please. Okay. One more question. Okay. Yes. Yes, please. Yes. yes. Okay. Um, yeah, the if the patient we have the more older patient, like the fifteen years old or 20, 20 years old, is that so? Patient, we, we can use the uh, the split thickness of carbarium bone graft uh, instead of the full thickness. Yeah, yeah, um, I th I think that's um, it'll depend on the degree of hypoplasia. Often the ones who are older are not as severe, so. Um, it often onlays on some some remnants of the zygoma, in which case I think split calvarial is okay. Mm -hmm. um, and also, it, it's just um, that uh, Linton Whitaker's old paper from the 1980s, I think is still very valid that onlay bone um, in this area, which includes split graft, tends to resorb over time. Um, I think the difference though is in an older patient, you could wait for the bone to finish doing what it's gonna do. And then if you ever wanted to put implants in as a secondary procedure. But overall, I do prefer full thickness, um, even though it does overcorrect, by the time the bone finishes its healing, it's at the right position. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Honda, thank you. Thank you, Professor Honda. Uh, next, I'd like to invite our own um, Professor Lin. Hi, Professor Hopper. And uh, from your, your technique, I, I find out that uh, would be very difficult for me to uh, do some distraction at the same time for maxilla and mandible. During the surgery, you place the occlusal splint in the place, and then after surgery, you, you read, uh, use the red uh, device to, to distract the whole complex. And at the same time, you also do the uh, mandibular uh, distractor. How how uh, can we uh, apply these two distractor at the different position of three dimensional and then control them to uh, simultaneously and keep also the occlusion at the same uh, at the same time without without uh, without change the occlusion relationship. Yeah, that's a that's a very good question. I um and and I just want to clarify the. During the activation phase, you're correct. The jaws are wired shut, so they move. They, it's they're, they're forced to stay together. But once the activation is finished and they enter consolidation, it's the, the wires are released so they can open and close because then the mandible is held by the mandible distractor and the mid face is held by the mid face. So the the MMF is only during the activation phase, which usually lasts around three weeks. Um, I, I did not know what rate to do. I, I, I actually guessed that it was a faster rate for the mandible and a slower rate for the maxilla. But what I did for the first few, as I tried different rates and tried to see based on uh, how the cephalogram was changing, um, how the face was changing, it seems to be just a one-to-one -one ratio. <clears throat> so for every millimeter of mandible, it's one millimeter on the halo. But the secret I find, are, there's two secrets to it. One secret is to make sure that there's always a little bit of tension on the wires, that you're never pushing with the mandible, you're always pulling with the, the mid face. And so I'll start by activating the mid face at the very beginning until I get tension on the wires and I can feel the tension. And that's when I start turning both devices a millimeter a day. And then the final secret, the second secret is you the, the the initial vector on a, on a sort of a side plane is 45 degrees um but what um after the chin gets to the bottom you have to change the angle as high vertical as possible so that it goes up almost vertically so you change those arms vertically and that forces the rest of the rotation so halfway through the rotation you change the angle almost verticalize it and that that makes it so it's equal turning but make sure the pressure's on the the, the maxilla and or the, the pull is on the maxilla and then just change um, 
uh, change the vector halfway through so it's almost vertical. But thank you, those are very good, very good points. Thank you, Dr. Lin. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lin. And next, I'd like to invite uh, Professor Tinsen Liu. Hi, thank you, Dr. Uh, Harper. Uh, I just have a question is, um, how do you decide the end point of this distraction? Um, because you want to overcorrect, but how, is, how do you decide is yes, I, overcorrection? I don't have that answer yet, Dr. Liu. I, I hope to have it uh, as more and more long-term data comes, but, but the, that's why I th thought it was important for me to present my five-year data um, to show the good and the, the relapse of C3DO. So you're right, I, I've learned now that I need to overcorrect. Um, usually these severe treacher colons have around 20 to 25 degrees of rotation deformity. So to rotate 25 degrees will correct it and create a level, a level plane. I try now actually to slightly overcorrect um, if I can to be able to create almost a little bit of a reverse rotation deformity by a few degrees. Um, so I would say if we correct, if we are able to um, create a, somewhere around five degrees of overcorrection and have the maxilla slightly tilted up, but the mandible still joining it, then I think by the time it comes back, it'll be in a better position. So that's my goal now, but I'll, I'll only be able to tell you if that's successful another five years from now. <laughs> Thank you. So do you keep the distractor like longer than um, twice the uh, activation phase? I do. I, I do it three times and I don't know if that's needed or not. I'm just very, uh, these are such complex kids. I just don't, I don't want to um, take any chances. Um, so yeah, yeah, typically it's three months. The activation mm -hmm. phase is usually one month. So it's three times the length for consolidation. Um, it also lets the, um, the soft tissues relax because I'll be going through the coronal incision again for the cheekbones. And so it makes it a little bit easier for that coronal incision three months later, as opposed to two months later. Thank you very much. No, thank you, Dr. Liu, thank you. Thank you, Professor Liu. And last but not least, I'd like to invite uh, Professor Derek Steinbecker. Great, thank you. That, that was excellent, Richard, as uh, usual. And, um, you know, I just had some questions about the condyle and, and glenoid. Um, and if you have any tricks for how you set that and what type of stop that can serve as, um, and, you know, both in the setting of distraction and, as well as have you had any of these patients that are old enough now that then need definitive orthognathic and how has that condyle held up, you know, I've had a few patients that the condyle after repeated distraction has eroded to such an extent that they need total joint replacements. Um, and when you go back to put the zygoma, you know, are, are you repositioning the condyle at that point or any tricks related to that? Great. Yeah, okay. thanks, thanks, Derek. I, I think that that's a, a very good question to, to end on is the, the importance of the condylar relationship, um, that centric relation. And um, I think it's, I think the um, I agree with you that the the effects of distraction on the condyle, never mind rib grafts, but even condyles, is um, underreported um, in our literature. The effect of distraction on on condyles. I I've had patients where I'll do a mandible distraction, um, and then ten years later, I'm looking at their CT scan, and I go, "Wow, that condyle looks really unusual." And I look at what the condyle looked like before the distraction ten years ago, and it looked much more healthy than it looks like ten years later. So I think we are causing damage to condyles with distraction, um, which is why I try to protect with the transfacial pin. So far, um, again, I'm only now seeing five years later, so we'll see. The grafts seem to be holding up very nicely. They stay robust, they stay thick, they continue to grow, um, so they do not atrophy. So I think um, making sure that there's no pressure on them during the C3DO is very important. I think the second part of the question is the glenoid relationship. And I was all, you know, just like you were taught um, to do um, a formal glenoid reconstruction um, with um, you know, a vertical endpoint, the arch, and then getting a meniscus in there. And we've all seen those, those um, figures in, in the um, textbooks. Whereas now I think a lot of us are realizing we do not need, it's not a good idea to reconstruct the glenoid and do the rib graft at the same time. I think the ankylosis risk is very high. And I think the other th thing we're learning is that it's, it's not necessary to place the condyle graft um, behind a zygomatic arch graft. We, you can, as long as it rests at a good point on the skull base, 
which tends to be a little bit more medial um, than and a little bit more posterior than than would be anatomic. Um, it stays in a good position, and so that's where the virtual planning helps. And I also also add on stereotactic navigation. So I pick the spot on the skull base I want the graph to go, and I make sure it goes exactly there. So it tends to be a little bit more medial and a little bit more posterior, so that it's resting almost like resting not not right here, which is anatomic would by the you know the glenoid and the arch, but it's almost resting like right right here. Um, and I find and I find that helps. And in, in that case, I. Um, the graphs stay okay. The central collation, the five-year data shows that we're not losing, we're not losing the mandible differentially. It's not like the mandible is falling back more than the maxilla, so it's not like the rib graphs are resorbing. Um, but the final question is, is what is this going to be like when you do double jaw surgery? Um, I don't know. I'll probably be referring all those cases to you and to, to my partner, Sinu. So you'll have to let us know how they go. <laughs> or to John Phillips, if he's still in practice. <laughs> or Dr. Chen, <laughs> Professor Chen. <laughs> It'll be very, it will good. be very Thank complex, you. complex cases, but I think uh, no more complex than what you guys are doing with the, you know, the secondary uh, syndromic uh, double jaw surgery. So I look forward to that phase of the data as well. Great. Thanks so much. Thank you, Derek. Thank you, Professor Steinbacher. Um, now, before we uh, head on to our Q&A session, I'd like to invite uh, Professor Lowe for some comments. Uh, hi, Dr. Harper. Uh, it's very nice to hear your talk, excellent talk. And uh, for such a complex, difficult cases, and I, you really achieved a very nice result. And we all learn from you tonight. Uh, I just have a small question that regard, regarding the timing, seven years old, nine years old, uh, you mentioned seven years, so uh, we don't know that you you said you will continue to follow up the patient, and it, at the end you will you will have a double jaw surgery. Uh, uh, certainly, if we do it nine years old, uh, you you are pretty much sure that uh, the facial deformity will be even milder in the future compared to you do it seven years old. So I I'm curious about this seven years so, uh, so maybe we're looking forward to hear your uh, long-term outcome. The other thing is the overcorrection. We do believe that we need to overcorrect the, the, the bone uh, deficiency. Yeah, also how much overcorrection is, maybe in the future we will we'll listen to your answer. But anyway, thank you very much for your excellent talk tonight. No, thank you, Pro Professor Lowe. I, I agree with you. If, if I had to pick the ideal time to do the C3PO, if I had my choice for every patient, I would say it would be somewhere around 10 to 12 years old, almost like when we do an early Lefort 1 distraction for a very severe cleft patient. Um, number one, it gets them ready for their high school, you know, with, without a tracheostomy. Um, and number two is, as you say, the bone is more stable, the teeth are more stable. Um, but the patient is still young enough to go through this very complex surgery, um, which is very hard for an uh, older teenager or a young adult to go through. Um, so if I was to pick the ideal age, it would be 10 to 12 years old. Um, but it's, it's like uh, Nupur just mentioned, if, uh, if I wait too long, I'll start to lose my patients as well. <laughs> um, so they're willing to wait until seven. And, and I'll, if it's the right family, I'll say, hey, you know, if just to let you know, my, my ideal age is, you know, eight or nine, and I can often get them to wait a little bit longer, but it's very much uh, consumer demand. It's, it's uh, they're, they're patients, but they're also consumer uh, customers, and, and it's, it's customers um, wanting to have their surgery and get the tracheostomy out early. But, I, but thank you, I agree. It, it's important for us to recognize that uh, timing of craniofacial surgery is essential and, and to try to get it as close to optimum as possible. Thank you, Professor Law. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lo. Now, um, last but not least, I'd like to invite Professor Yurei Chen. Professor Chen. Thank you, uh, Dr. Dr. Hope. It is very, very nice idea and very, very good result. Well, to uh, be able to remove this kind of a very difficult tracheosomy out is very difficult. Now you do provide a way to get it out or almost 90, 95%. It's very, very good. Well, uh, the conclusion as all this kind of discussion as you have, as we have here, the timing is so important, destruction. You mentioned about 10 years old or 11 is much better than seven years or eight years, it's true. But for early removal of tracheostomy is so difficult and it's worthwhile doing two surgeries if necessary. So it's a kind of a buying 
uh, the time that we do early so that the candidate will target something out. And hopefully, uh, as you, your result is almost 95 uh, and 100% without redo the trapezoid. So, well, it's, it's still worthwhile. It's a very good idea to have all this kind of scalp based uh, planning of the whole rotation and to have this result. Thank you for your contributions and your talk. Very nice tonight. No, thank you very much, Professor Yuri Chen. Again, as, as the international expert on bimaxillary surgery, I, 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 um, I'm honored by your, 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 your comments and your questions. I agree with you that, um, the burden of a tracheostomy and the risk of a tracheostomy is is huge and um, and any opportunities we have to remove it. So if there is an opportunity to remove the tracheostomy early, even if it's in a two-stage surgery, I think that's reasonable. But um, the, the concern is I've only done the C3DO once in a patient that didn't have a tracheostomy. It was actually a, an adult that had um, previous radiation and um, had the same rotation deformity, but because of radiation. Um, and it was a, it was a, it was a very challenging experience, not only for the patient but for me as well and my team. Um, so I think uh, doing it uh, to, to t if, if the tracheostomy is removed, let's say with an isolated mandible distraction, um, the tracheostomy would have to go back in for the C3DO procedure. So that's the other thing to consider is. Um, um, any previous surgeries to remove the tracheostomy would mean that the tracheostomy has to go in for this surgery. If, if uh, in, in its current state, it may change the, the, as new people divide, uh, come up with new techniques, but I think the tracheostomy is required. But thank you, Professor Uri Chen. That's, that's a good comment. Hey, uh, thank you once again to our, our panelists for the comments and the questions. Now uh, we'll proceed on to the Q&A session. And uh, I think we have a few questions that were answer during the um, the panelist discussion. So I'll skip over them. But the first question is from Dr. Poryon Chen. Uh, the question is, how do you perform the transfacial mandibular pin? And um, what structures should we watch out for? Yes, I know it looks it looks scary when I show those um, those pictures, but, but uh, it's actually quite um, an easy technique with these little tricks that I, I learned the hard way. Um, so it's important to, to plan the position of the holes um, ahead of time, um, preferably with you know, virtual planning. But if you know where the pins are gonna go in on one side and out on the other, um, what I'll do is, um, I can't remember the exact width of the Steinman pin that I use, but it's, um, it's roughly around two and a half millimeters um, diameter. And so I'll pre-drill those, the two holes here, and I'll go to the other side through the RISDEN and pre-drill those two holes. So now I have the two holes, the, the four holes already drilled. Then what I'll do is I'll get the Steinman pin and I'll put it through the first hole and I'll put my finger inside the mouth behind the tonsillar pillar. And when you put your finger behind the tonsillar pillar, it's, it, 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 you touch the ramus and you can feel the ramus and you can make sure there's no artery there. So it's a very small distance. It's only maybe around eight millimeters to a centimeter, not even a centimeter that you'll, you're, you're, you can feel your pin pass into the oropharynx behind the tonsil. And then um, you can look through the mouth and you'll see the pin. You can grab it with a little hook just to keep it away from the pharynx. And the secret to get it to the other hole on the other side is a very small suction, the same suction that the otolaryngologists use to suction the ears, the myringotomy suction. You can pass that through the hole on the other side. You can see the suction now in the, so this is the suction coming in by the pharynx. This is your pin you see by the pharynx. You just put the two, you put the pin, the point of the pin in, and then just slide it in, and it slides right through the other hole. So once I learned that secret, it was very quick. That was actually my partner, Dr. Edinger, who's now, um, he was my fellow at the time. He came up with that idea. So I call that the Edinger technique. <laughs> That's an amazing idea. <laughs> yeah, it's very smart. Okay, and for our next question, we have a question from Dr. Sagar Mehta. And the question is, what is the rate of your distraction? Um, I, I usually start the rotation a little bit faster, just like I would for a syndromic. So I'll start at two millimeters a day for only maybe five days, just to get that first centimeter of generate forming. And then I'll slow down to one millimeter a day, um, just because uh, you, you want, it's a, it's a very strong soft tissue force that you have to fight against. So I don't want to do that too fast, but I, I do um, just to stop the risk of premature consolidation. I'll, I'll start at two millimeters a day in a, in a seven year old or a 10 year old. If they're older, I probably would just start at one millimeter a day. 
Okay. Thank and you. do you start that um, immediately, like the day after, or do you have a latency no, period? No, five, 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 five day uh, latency period. Yeah, yeah. Just for just for respecting the mandible, five day latency period. Okay. And our next question is from Dr. Jordan Steinberg, and the question is: How do you convince families of a newborn TCS? patient with no uh with trek to wait five to seven years and prevent them from going to another center where mdo will be offered yeah hi jordan uh, good, good to see you join us um yeah the new product kind of asked a similar question yeah. um and uh sometimes you can't and so I, I you always have to be willing for a patient to make their own decision um but you have to stick to what you think is best so i think i i, I I, I really try to have the strength not to do something I don't feel is right just because a patient's really forcing me and threatening to go to another doctor. So that's one thing. The other one is getting them in touch with other families through social media or connection saying, you know, it's worth waiting. That helps that helps to hear that from another family as opposed to only hearing it from the doctors. And then um, we, it, 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 it doesn't make sense to sort of offer them a mandible distraction. I try not to, but that being said, one of my my recent fellows, um, Samir, uh, um, who's uh, in uh, Milwaukee right now, had the same situation, and he's got a lot of pressure for the mandible distraction. I said, okay, well, it's not unreasonable to do the mandible distraction. Just do it right, minimal damage, watch out for the condyles, but just tell the family they're still going to need a C3DO, and most likely the tracheostomy is not going to be able to stay out. So usually families, when they get all that information, they make the right decision. If they don't, that's their choice. You can't, you can't force families. Okay, and for our last question, we have a question from Dr. Longvena, and the question is, um, how old um, is the patient uh, when you create the condyle by using the rib bone? The, um, yeah, it, it's very similar to kind of what, what um, Dr. Lowe was saying in terms of timing. If I was to pick the ideal time to do a rib graft, again, it would be somewhere around 12 to 14 years of age. The rib is nice and strong, and you know, you get this you know, great fixation, but that's just not an option. So usually what I, the, the earliest, I, I, I think it's reasonable. It's okay to do rib grafts as early as three years of age, but to convince a family to wait until seven, usually what I'll do is if the second molar follicle needs to be removed before the rib graft, because there's not enough bone to fix the rib graft on, then I'll usually remove the second molar follicle somewhere around three or four years of age. And then I'll wait a year and I'll do the rib graft at around five or six years of age. And then that lets me then do the C3DO around seven or eight years of age. So it's a way for the families to kind of um, not have to wait all the way to seven and eight, but start to have the, the sequence started around the age of three or four if the second molar needs to be enucleated or five or six if the rib graft is the first stage. Okay, and um, Dr. Meta want to, um add on his previous question, um, what is your experience with curvilinear distractors? Um, I, I have used them. I find them um, bulky. I think they're, they're, they're big to put in, even the new ones. Um, so I'm always worried, does that have an impact on, uh, you know, the periosteal coverage and the blood supply? Um, it is nice how you can use them with virtual planning to plan a more accurate placement of your symphysis. But um, in these patients specifically, uh, the, the mandibles are always small enough that curvilinears are just not an option with the current devices. So if, 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 if a curvilinear would fit on the mandible, it's probably not a uh, the patient probably doesn't need C3DO. They probably could be treated by more conventional means. So I, I think they're, um, they're good devices in the right patients, but not usually in this more severe phenotype. Okay, so thank you, Junior. So I think the all the question already be answered by Professor Harper. Uh, finally, I would like to uh, really appreciate all the presentation by Dr. Harper for our participant in ICC. And thank you, Richard, to make all the webinar uh, possible. Uh, even now, it's a very early morning in Seattle uh, and uh, in the Asia. Now it's very late, but I, we already, always very enjoy your talk. So I have my own personal request. If I have the second opportunity to invite you to be our visiting professor when I was in Dallas, uh, that is my year of research fellowship in UT Southwestern, you have been my visiting professor. I learned a lot from you. So I would like to probably in the coming year or in the future to invite you personally to give us our junior 
um, the student or uh, like me, the middle aged the doctor, as you are uh, for your teaching and under your guidance. So I think today's your presentation really benefit for those who take care of those treater callings uh, a lot and under your guidance. So thank you again. So finally, I would like to invite all our participants to show up, okay? You can turn on your screen and we have the chance to have the group photo together with Professor Richard Harper. So come out, come out, don't be shy. <laughs> By the way, I would like to thank you all our six very experienced panelists. Thank you, Clement. Thank you, Tinchen. Thank you, Nupor. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Chakayuki. Thank you, Derek, and thank you, uh, my always the Korean professor, Jong Woo Choice. And I will count to three, and the priest give me you a very big smile. One, two, cheese. Yeah. One more. Yeah. I will turn to the second page. Wait a minute. Okay. One more time. One, two, cheese. Very good. Very good. So, uh. Professor Harper, would you like give me one more minute to promote the IC, ICFS in Seattle next year? <laughs> I'll, I'll take the minute to promote Chungang Hospital. It's um, ever since I was a resident <laughs> in, in uh, the hospital for sick kids, working with you know Chris Forrest and John Phillips. I I just uh, read every paper that came out of your institution. You, you've you've really been thought leaders um, for for the world. So. Any opportunity to um, to um, have a chance to, to to visit or to have shared experiences, I would really uh, look forward to that. I again, I'd just like to echo um, the thanks that you just gave again for um, uh, you know a, a Dr. A Professor Lin and Professor Chen for for supporting such an event, and and also Dr. Cho and Dr. Tu for your hard work and being able to pull this together. Just knowing the work that I'm putting into making sure Seattle is a is a wonderful educational experience next year. I understand the work that's required to to pull off things like you you did today. So thank you very much for the the chance for me to join you. Um, I hope you all have good sleeps as as I start my day in Seattle <laughs> and have sweet dreams. But um, I look forward to seeing you all in Seattle September fifth to eighth next year. Yeah. So wish the big success in Seattle next year, and I hope all the participants can join the EC in you in person in Seattle with Professor Harper. Okay. Thank you very much, and uh, keep in touch. And looking forward to seeing you in the next coming week, the same speaker from Seattle Children, uh, Dr. Raymond. So good morning and good evening. Thank you very much. See you. Bye-bye. 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 Thank you, Professor. Good night. Good night. Okay, Junior, thank you. Thank you. Okay, you. good work. Oh, I hope not to Taiwan. <laughs> yeah. Okay, okay. Oh, see you, Junior. Sorry. Bye. Yeah. Good night. Bye. Bye. Good night.